So in this presentation, I'll be giving you a short overview of the neuroanatomy of selected monoaminergic systems and their relevance for biomedical imaging in general or neuroscience in particular. You might ask yourself, why should we be interested in the brainstem, which is the part of the brain where most of these uh, neurotransmitter systems are localized? So the reasons why this part of the brain is particularly interesting are, first of all, that it is evolutionarily well conserved, meaning that the um, functions which it is uh, responsible for have uh, a higher continuity between model animals and humans. This means if you're doing uh, translational neuroscience that whatever statements you're able to make about these neurotransmitters in the mouse have a higher probability of being accurately translatable to humans. The constituent structures which are in this part of the brain perform a number of tasks, most of which are non-volitional. This is quite interesting simply because the non-volitional aspects of brain function are those which you can, by definition, least well control via the simple force of volition, meaning that they are those functions which you would most like to control via other means, be it pharmacology or something else. And on, uh, a last uh, reason why you might be interesting, interested in studying these systems in a biomedical context is simply that uh, they're very simple. So systems which are located in the brainstem, of which monoaminergic systems are a part, are generally quite simple in their structure as compared to, for instance, cortical regions. If you, can th if you think of the cortex, you basically have very many neurons which are um, chemically quite similar, but which perform very different functions, meaning that you have a high degree of specialization on the cortex to neurons which are next to each other are very unlikely to actually perform highly similar functions. Whereas in the brainstem, the organization is more a one of nuclei, meaning that you don't have this cortex which envelops the brainstem, but you have small uh, aggregations of cells inside the brainstem in which uh, you have a higher similarity between the individual cells. Uh, if you look at the brainstem in this drawing, you will see that it's uh, it's subdivided in three parts, the midbrain, the pons, and the medulla oblongata. The systems which we're talking about are predominantly located in the midbrain and the pons, so actually in the somewhat higher parts of the brainstem. Now, I've mentioned that these systems are evolutionarily well conserved and that this is particularly relevant if you're doing translational neuroscience. So a couple of examples of that uh, can be seen if you look at the dopaminergic systems across animals. And here in the left hand most figure, you, we can see a mapping of the dopaminergic systems from the teleost, which is a category of bony fish, all the way up to mammals. And you, can no you will note that there is a similar localization of um, dom uh, dopaminergic cells in the brainstem. You can see that here as the um, ellipsoids, which basically denote nuclei and that they project similarly into more uh, more rostral parts of the brain, particularly here the striatum, which is a main target of dopaminergic systems. So, so basically what, what you see on this left-hand column is the structural conservation across evolution. You could call this a sort of analogy of the systems. If you look on the right-hand more figures, you will see a description of uh, the function of serotonergic neurotransmitter system, which is involved in very, very many higher level functions, not least of all in social dominance. And in the central figure here, you will see that the expression of serotonergic synthesis correlates with um, the dominant status in crayfish, which are basically sweetwater lobsters. And on the right hand most uh, figure, you can see that pharmacology, which uh, affects uh, serotonin uh, reuptake and or synthesis, can lead to the formation of either dominance or submission in vervet monkeys. So basically here you see that across the animal kingdom and even in the two different main families of the protostoma and the deuterostoma, you have a conservation of the jobs which the serotonergic system does. This basically underpins the statement uh, which I made earlier that you have higher translational validity. If you want to think of it in uh, like evolutionarily biological terms here, you could say that here you observe a case where you have both analogy and homology for the same system. Now, looking at what exactly the monoamines are, they're basically simple molecules which are defined by this uh, structure which you see in the middle of the image here. It's a phenol ring with an ethylamine side chain, and this can be found in all of the monoamines. There's a number of different monoamines, of which we will be looking at three, dopamine, noradrenaline, and serotonin, 
And these monoamines, as well as others, can be broken down into families based on their synthesis. So, for instance, monoamines, which are synthesized from tyrosine, uh, are called catecholamines, and those which are synthesized from tryptophan are called indolamines. Uh, in the first family, we have dopamine and noradrenaline, and the second family, we have serotonin. Uh, looking at the selected systems, you can see that indeed they are comprised of nuclei which are located primarily in the brainstem, and more specifically, the midbrain or the pons. Uh, here you see the nuclei as circles, and there are a number of nuclei, so there's not just one nucleus per neurotransmitter, though we will be looking at a subset of them which are here labeled with, uh, with letters. The locus ceruleus in blue for the noradrenergic system, the dorsal raphe in green for the serotonergic system, and the uh, substantia nigra and the VTA, which is the ventral tegmental area, in orange for the dopaminergic system. And you can see that uh, all of these uh, systems are broken up in these different nuclei, of which only some project primarily ascendingly, so meaning uh, towards the more rostral parts of the brain. We're looking at these nuclei in particular simply because the fact that they project rostrally means that they have a wider efferent field, so they project to more parts of the brain, meaning that they are more interesting for biomedical modeling, uh, and also more likely to be involved in higher level, uh, more interesting functions uh, compared to the descending pathways, which are prim primarily involved in uh, motor or sensory activity. Looking at the serotonergic formations, uh, they comprise seven nuclei. They are called the raphe nuclei. Raphe here means seam. So they're, they're bas they basically bear this name because they are along the midline, so along the seam of the brain. These nuclei do not tend to be lateralized, which, which actually makes them special if you think of brain structures, of, mo of which most are lateralized. And the rostral uh, raphe nuclei, so the ones which are most far rostrally, those are the ones which have the highest uh, percentage of ascending projection. So ascending projections here means rostral projections, and it makes sense that the rostral most uh, nuclei have the rostral most projections. The bulk of these projections, which go towards the higher parts of the brain, so the ascending projections, the rostral projections, as I've described them, come from the dorsal raphe and the median raphe, which you can see here labeled with uh, B7 and B8. If you look at uh, where exactly the dorsal raphe is located, which we've established will be the nucleus which uh, we're going to concentrate on, you can see here on the right-hand side a map which is defined on a standard MR template, meaning that you can use this map to, uh, to analyze your MRI data for uh, dorsal raphe activity or for functional connectivity from the dorsal raphe. And uh, the dorsal raphe proper here is located uh, in the dorsal medial midbrain tegmentum, and it's right underneath the aqueduct. The aqueduct is a channel which um, connects different spaces filled with cerebrospinal fluid. Notably, you shouldn't confuse this with the red nucleus. I mean, the, the word raphe might, might sound a bit like red, but these are two completely different nuclei. If we look at a breakdown of the brain and all of the projections of the dorsal raphe sourced from literature, we can see a picture which is similar to this. Uh, this is actually not exhaustive, and this will be a theme among all of the figures, simply because it is very difficult for such a small structure, which has such few neurons, to obtain an exhaustive list of really where it projects, including the regions to which it might project just a bit. So these are the regions for which, which are A, particularly relevant, so they are well documented, and B, for which there exists a certain amount of evidence that there really are significant dorsal raphe projections. The, the consideration that basically this uh, nucleus contains only very few cells is quite important, simply because on one hand, you might think of it as a problem, but actually it is quite a big advantage, simply because if you think of brain connectivity, if you want to think of brain connectivity at all, uh, the way you would break this up, so the way you would try to understand brain connectivity is to model different parts of the brain as nodes in a network. And the connection between the nodes would be given by the amount of fibers which, which are actually between these nodes. And if you ever look at a DTI, so at, at a diffusion tensor imaging representation of the brain, you will notice that you have the highest connectivity between uh, brain hemispheres. Uh, but that, in fact, is a pretty useless from the functional analysis point of view connectivity, simply because the cortex uh, 
does not really function homogeneously, meaning that uh, these fibers do not necessarily mean that there is node-like activity in the regions in which they connect. This is because each and every single connection might in fact communicate a completely different aspect of the information which is processed. And we can understand this given uh, the fact that the neurons in the cortex are highly specialized for highly specific functions. The dorsal raphe nuclei are highly similar with each other. Now, there, there is, of course, variability, but they're much more similar to each other than cortical neurons, which is why here the case can really be made that this really is a node-like structure in the brain, which conveys homogeneous information to a vast majority of the areas into which it projects. This is very interesting simply because by stimulating this part of the brain, you can then say that you evoke a coherent activation pattern and not just propagating noise. So this, uh, this representation here basically shows you that a very small nucleus can reach very many different parts of the brain and can reach them with a similar coherent, one might speculate, information. Now, if we're looking at the function specifically, if we can find something which uh, supports the, these claims which we've made, we might stimulate these nuclei and see whether or not they evoke coherent activity patterns in the brain. And in fact, opto-fMRI, so optogenetic stimulation coupled with functional magnetic resonance imaging gives across at least two different studies a highly similar picture of serotonergic activation of the brain. This is quite uncommon for fMRI in the mouse simply because it is notoriously difficult to establish assays which really give you highly reproducible activation pictures. But as we can see here for the serotonergic system, we do see this. So this is a system which, in addition to having high translational value and significant involvement in phenomena of high biological interest, also gives you a consistent pattern which you can use as a benchmark for establishing new imaging modalities. So for instance, if you're trying to uh, complement the pattern of imaging modalities by uh, establishing something new, for instance, optoacoustics is a method which is receiving increasing uh, an increasing amount of attention, you might say, okay, I'm, I, I would like to benchmark this against a system for which I know what kind of activity to reliably expect. And in that case, the serotonergic system would be ideal. Not least of all, because if you look at these projections, you will notice that other than in the dorsal raphe or more generally the midbrain and the pons, the activity which you elicit is actually negative. And this is quite interesting simply because negative activity is somewhat more difficult to elicit in a controlled manner in uh, the model brain than positive activity. So in addition to all of the other advantages which you could reap by studying the system, uh, you shouldn't forget that it is uh, a more than valuable potential benchmark for imaging methods. And again, even if you're just trying to benchmark imaging methods, you should bear in mind that due to the implication of the system in interesting phenomena and due to the translational validity of studying such a system, you might as an entire byproduct of your imaging methods development discover new features of the system which are of high biological relevance. I think this is something you should always keep in mind. Basic research knowledge is uh, sometimes discovered uh, on purpose, uh, but very often also is formed as a byproduct of the study of uh, other phenomena, of more applied phenomena. So in this case, you would say, okay, the development of imaging is in the direction of applied research, but if we use the development on models which are of high biological and neuroscientific relevance, we might actually stumble across highly interesting things which are of uh, enormous value to basic research. Now, if you're trying to differentiate afferent uh, fields of the dorsal raphe, you can basically navigate your way in the midbrain uh, to uh, different nuclei from the spectrum which I, which I presented earlier. So if you want to go for more lateral areas, you could uh, stimulate in the dorsal raphe. And if you want to go for more medial areas, you might stimulate in the median raphe. Uh, however, uh, these nuclei are far enough apart so that this can be done in a controlled manner. So for instance, in the data which I, project, uh, I presented earlier, it is truly predominantly dorsal raphe stimulation. So this is not necessarily something you have to worry about. But this is something which you want to, which you might want to keep in mind if you ever want to vary exactly what parts of the brain you stimulate. For instance, 
if you want to benchmark a new technique and see, okay, in how far can I pick up these, uh, these differences of the efferent distribution? Of course, having lauded the study of the dorsal raphe so much, you might think that this is a sort of pacemaker of the brain, which controls all sorts of other phenomena. And this is, of course, not the case. There is no central neuron or central area of the brain which controls the rest and is not controlled by anything. The brain is a network. And of course, if you look at the dorsal raphe, in normal function, there are numerous areas which project to it and control it, including, interestingly, other monoaminergic ne- areas, such as the way you can see it in this figure, the substantia nigra and the VTA. So you really shouldn't try to read, like even if you study it intently, you shouldn't really try to reduce these phenomena based on dorsal raphe activity. Of course, if you use stimulation techniques such as opto-fMRI, you do more or less drive or you could say even clamp the area, meaning that you introduce activity way in excess of what is physiologically present there. And you do for the duration of your stimulation, at least completely override these physiological feedback loops. However, they exist in the normal brain function, so you should always bear this in mind, particularly if you want to look into more subtle studies of uh, dorsal raphe function, for instance, via um, functional connectivity in the absence of stimulation. Now, that about wraps it up for the serotonergic system, but we can try to have a look at the dopaminergic system and see the differences as well as parallels. So uh, the first thing you'd notice if you look at the projection, so at the efferent spectrum of dopaminergic uh, neurons from the midbrain, you will notice that they are much more focal than what you would see from the serotonergic system. They can be broken up in a number of pathways, the most important of which are the mesolimbic pathways. So here you can read what the pathway means. So it's topological organization from the name. Mesolimbic simply means from the midbrain, so meso to the limbic system. That's a mesolimbic pathway, and it starts from the VTA, so from the ventral tegmental area. The mesocortical pathway, so again, from the midbrain to the cortex. The nigrostriatal pathway, which co- comes from the substantia nigra, so that's why you'd call it nigro, and striatal because it projects into the striatum. Uh, more specifically here, the dorsal striatum, simply because the, the ventral striatum is uh, actually projected to by the mesolimbic pathway. And these are like the three main pathways, which you can then again group based on the origin of the fibers, and you would get to the mesocorticolimbic and the nigrostriatal pathways, uh, of which the former is rooted in the VTA, in the ventral tegmental area, and the latter is rooted in the substantia nigra, SN, the way you see them labeled in this drawing. So these would be the main two pathways of of ascending dopaminergic projections. And this is very interesting simply because uh, you don't really have this distinguished to such a degree for the serotonergic system. So if you're looking to break up the distribution of projections, perhaps the dopaminergic system might be something which you would rather consider. Again, I'm talking now from the point of view of the development of new measurement assays or establishment of new or validation of new measurement assays. Also, you will notice that the areas to which the dopaminergic system projects are quite, uh, are, are, are a bit more concentrated than for the serotonergic system. Again, if you look at the appearance of the structure of the VTA, so we, we have two areas to choose from. We're going to detail the VTA, so the mesocortical limbic projections in, in the remaining slides for the dopaminergic system. And if you look at the VTA, you'll see that it is again located in the midbrain, but now more ventrally between a number of other nuclei. So the interpeduncular nucleus, the medial lemniscus, and the cerebral peduncle. And these are all structures which are primarily related to motor and sensory function. So to uh, consistently more primitive aspects of brain function. But again, in this brainstem, in this structure, which is uh, overall involved in more primitive phenomena, you also have a lot of phenomena which are which have stayed with us, which are of very high interest in the study of the brain, but which relate to higher brain function. The dopaminergic system is one of these systems which is responsible for such phenomena. If we look, if we try to map out the projections in a similar fashion as we have done for the dorsal raphe, now for the VTA specifically, not not for all of the dopaminergic projections, we will get a spectrum looking somewhat like this. And what you can see immediately here is that the projections from the VTA are much more focal, meaning that they don't go as broadly as the ones from the dorsal raphe. They are much more localized, 
which could be an advantage or a disadvantage if you want to use the system as a benchmark, depending on what exactly it is you want to do. So if you want to test your sensitivity for more localized projections, this is actually a very good system to study. If you need the uh, overarching uh, activation or inactivation to cover most of the brain, perhaps the Srodnergic system might be preferable for you to study. Again, this list cannot be exhaustive, but these are some of the areas which are consistently implicated in, uh, uh, in being innervated by the dopaminergic system. Again, we might ask ourselves, okay, so we, we know all of these things about structure. Does any of this translate well into function? Uh, and here, the, the research done in our lab, at least, is not as extensive as for the serotonergic system. However, again, we see very high stability in the functional afferences from the VTA. And now we can present not just two different studies done by different operators in different cohorts in the mouse, but here we have two different studies done by two different operators with two different cohorts, but also in two different species. So on the left-hand side figure, we have a study done in rats, and on the right-hand side figure, a study done in mice. And you can see in both cases, uh, optogenetic stimulation. So this is again opto-fMRI, just as before. Optogenetic stimulation concurrent with functional magnetic resonance imaging. And again, we see an activation in the midbrain, in the VTA. In the rat study, this would be the last slice. And in the mouse study, you can see this in, in the middle, in the horizontal um, cut plane. And in addition to this, we have a significant and primarily ipsilateral, so on the same side of the brain, weighted uh, activation in the striatum. And it's interesting here because this demonstrates how uh, something which you might just have intended as a uh, proof of principle for your imaging could produce very valuable biological insight. And basically what you see here is that uh, you have significant activation not just in the ventral stratum, which is something you'd expect from the mesocortical limbic uh, pathway of dopaminergic innervation of the forebrain, but you also have significant activation and perhaps even stronger in the dorsal striatum. So ju just to give you a quick recap, ventral means more towards the stomach, so here it is downwards, and dorsal means more towards the back, so here it is upwards, given the way in which the, the mouse is structured. And this is something which you wouldn't necessarily expect from the structural projections, because we have talked earlier about the fact that the structural projections are primarily towards the ventral striatum in the mesocortical limbic pathway for which the cell bodies reside in the VTA, and it goes more to the dorsal striatum from the nigrostriatal pathway of which the neuronal cell bodies are located more in the substantia nigra. So here again we see in uh, two different animal species that we do get significant innervation of the dorsal striatum from VTA stimulation. Now, there could be very many explanations for this. It could be a multisynaptic connection. It could be that the activation uh, spreads in other ways. So it is. it could be possible that there are very few projecting fibers which, however, relay functional uh, uh, signals very strongly, although they show up not at all or very little in a structural analysis. But this is already an interesting observation about the functional role which the dopaminergic system from the VTA plays which can be discovered via a fairly simple imaging assay in, uh, in the mouse or the rat. So this, this would be an example of the ways in which you could really illuminate the functional understanding of the brain relevant for basic neuroscience, for psychopharmacology, for emotion research, for addiction research, while you're actually just working on some imaging benchmarks. So it could be, for instance, interesting to see, okay, is this result robust to a different modality? And if it is, it would not just validate the modality, but it would also further document this result, which is something that, again, is interesting from multiple points of view. Now, the same thing which is true for the sortenergic system is true for the dopaminergic system. Again, this is in no way, shape, or form a pacemaker part of the brain, and it receives a lot of input, so a lot of afferences as well. Uh, in this case, there is a specific quirk to the VTA, meaning that there is a structure which is adjacent to the VTA, the tail of the VTA, which mediates a lot of the inputs which the, the VTA gets. This in, in no way, shape, or form necessarily impacts the, the nucleus in the way we think of it, but it is something to bear in mind if, for instance, you want to look at how the VTA itself can be controlled by other nuclei. 
And this isn't just a theoretical concern, which might be relevant for your particular field of study independently of the monoaminergic systems. But again, if you look at the efferent spectrum, so at the areas which project to the VTA, you will see the dorsal raphe featuring in the left of these figures, meaning that there is, again, interconnectivity between the monoaminergic systems themselves. So when you stimulate the dorsal raphe, you might also want to consider in how far this acts on the VTA and in how far any activity which you see might be directly from the dorsal raphe or perhaps relayed by the VTA. This is an interesting considerant for which some modalities might no, have nowhere near enough sensitivity, but as the sensitivity of modalities, maybe even of the modalities which you're working on establishing becomes better and better, uh, such are the questions which you might then be better equipped to ask. The locus ceruleus is the prime seat of the last monoaminergic system which we're going to talk about, which is the noradrenergic system. And it is a nucleus, again, in the brainstem, this time in the pons. And the name comes from, you might, you might find the name quite uh, quirky, it comes from sky blue, ceruleus. And you might be a bit confused about how it's written, and with good reason, simply because over the years everybody's been quite a bit confused about how to write it. So a number of different spellings have been considered valid, and the one which is considered valid as of now is A-E. Uh, but in literature you might find any sort of variation. So... Given this information, you might ask yourself, okay, is this area really sky blue? I mean, that'd be a cool thing to see in the brain. And the answer, of course, is no. It's uh, not at all dark blue. In fact, if you look at this brain slice, this literal brain slice, this time from a human brain, you will see the locus ceruleus as two dark dots on the left and right side of the aqueduct in the middle of the image. If you've been looking at human histology for too long, you might be excused for thinking that these slight darkenings on an orange background are sky blue, but actually they're just darkenings and they come from neuromelanin. Neuromelanin is a pigment, it's a byproduct of the synthesis of catecholamines, which accumulates in these nuclei, which is why catecholaminergic nuclei generally will tend to have this somewhat darker color if you look at them really in the brain tissue optically. Now, what exactly neuromelanin does is uh, not at all clarified. We know that it accumulates with age, so it might simply be a byproduct of uh, imperfect synthesis, and that's, in that case, it would be a marker of senescence. So the more you have of it, the more time your neurons have spent doing uh, inefficient stuff, or it could even have a neuroprotective function. So the more you have of it, the more your neurons are um, bracing themselves for the perils of age. But it's, uh, so it's not really well studied. At any case, it's what gives this, these nuclei this distinctive coloring and what helped people very early on, even before their function was at all well understood, to identify them and talk about them. Now, if we look at the projections of the locus ceruleus, we will notice that uh, they have, they are very, very broad. And uh, perhaps this is also due to the fact that the locus ceruleus is more or less the only ascending neurodynergic pathway. So all of the previous monoaminergic systems, which I've talked to you about, both the serotonergic and the dopaminergic systems, had different nuclei, which projected uh, ascendingly, so rostrally. In the case of the serotonergic system, it was the dorsal raphe and the median raphe, which uh, broke down the, the efferent spectrum to more central or more lateral areas. In the case of the dopaminergic system, it was the VTA and the substantia nigra, which were associated with completely different pathways. Well, in the case of the neuroadrenergic system, it's based, it's practically, for all intents and purposes, just the locus ceruleus, which projects ascendingly. Additionally, it is the smallest of these nuclei with only about 1,500 neurons in the rat, so less than that in the mouse, or quite a bit more in the human. And it features, as you might expect, from such a small nucleus with so few neurons, which projects to so much of the brain, the fibers have a very high degree of collateralization, so you, which is basically a fancy name for branching. This means that one neuron might actually end up projecting to the forebrain, to subcortical structures, and even to the cerebellum, the same neuron. So this is the extent to which the axons branch out. Now, this makes the locus ceruleus perhaps most interesting with, in, in the sense that what I've said about all of the monoaminergic systems might apply most aptly to the locus ceruleus simply because all of this collateralization means that the effect which activity in this nucleus has on the rest of the brain 
might most of all be considered homogeneous. So that means in the others, the, the, the argument was, uh, well, these neurons are very similar, so if we stimulate them, they might do similar things throughout the brain, and there's also some collateralization. In this case, the argument is the same, but weighted to the second part, meaning that not only are these neurons very similar, but generally we stimulate one neuron, and that already projects to very different parts of the brain, but most likely it relays the same kind of activity because it is the same cell and you do not have the same ability to, di to differentiate the transmission of activity within branchings of the same cell as you do between branchings of different cells. It projects to virtually all areas of the cortex. So in this case, you, you might think of it as an, as an exclusive list because there's nothing left to project to. Of course, there might be patches of the brain where, where there is no noradrenergic activation. But if you look at the literature, you will find the uh, old manner of references for neuroadrenergic projection and uh, structural connectivity. And interestingly, among these areas, you will also see the VTA featured. And this is also relevant for a lot of psychopharmacology, simply because a lot of medication for addiction, for instance, is uh, based both on dopaminergic and on noradrenergic activity. So it might be that really this uh, downstream play that th there might really be a downstream placement of the VTA from the locus ceruleus, or there might be a complex feedback loop which uh, which re requires uh, levers to be pressed at both uh, at both places in the network for certain effects to be observed. Now this might be true for all combinations of the monoaminergic systems. It's just that here, based on psychopharmacology, we have the best indicator that such a prediction might actually have clinical relevance. Now. I would love to show you the same uh, functional stability for uh, neuroadrenergic stimulation in OptoFMRI, but sadly I cannot, as we have not yet performed these experiments. They are, however, upcoming. So we can move directly to the afferences, and again, we will observe that uh, this nucleus, uh, even though it is more node-like, perhaps, than all of the others, it's still not the, the Pope nucleus of the brain, it's not the pacemaker of the brain, it is upstream of very many regions, but also downstream of very many regions. Note again that you have afferences from the dorsal raphe, so you, you really shouldn't be thinking about this nucleus as the boss of the monoaminergic nuclei, because yes, true, it might project to the VTA, but the dorsal raphe projects to it, and the VTA projects to the dorsal raphe. So we, uh, we have a, co a very complex feedback loop, which is not well studied, but we know that all of these nuclei are interconnected in a complex fashion. Now, I've recommended studying these nuclei, not just for their neuroscientific relevance, but also for their applicability as benchmarks for biomedical imaging. So uh, what, what should be your preference ranking? And of course, your preference ranking depends on what exactly you're trying to do. If uh, you're considering how well we understand these connections, this has both a plus and a minus, simply because one uh, system which is very well understood, in that case, it means that whatever you observe about this system might be very aptly connected to other pieces of knowledge. Uh, but it might also mean that a lot of the things which you observe are already known. A system which is less well understood, well, in that case, you might not be able to make as many connections, but something which you discover might in fact be a completely new feature. So it's uh, it's hard to really quantify how well we understand them, but generally the vibe is that the VTA is best understood, not least of all due to the fact that it has the smallest range of efferent projections. The locus ceruleus has been studied quite intensely in humans. There is an entire literature on how it is related to neuronal gain, so controlling the endogenous signal to noise in brain activity. And the dorsal raphe is not that well studied as a nucleus. Although serotonin is incredibly well studied as a neurotransmitter, there are not that many studies on the dorsal raphe in particular. Another considerant which you might want to, um, to look at when deciding what to study is how extensive the projections are. And again, you might want really extensive projections because you might want to make sure that you have like activity throughout the brain and you can look at, okay, well, this activity is uh, approximately equally strong over these and these and these areas of the cortex and how well is our, Im in how far is our imaging homogeneous? Or you might want to have very, uh, a very patchwork picture where you can see, okay, well, what is the Im spatial impulse response function, which we can measure with our technique or something like that. And in that case, you would think of the locus ceruleus as the most widely projecting system. Again, we don't have the optofMRI data yet, uh, but I think it is without doubt that this will more or less uh, elicit responses in the vast majority of the brain. 
Uh, the dorsal raphe already elicit responses in a lot of the brain, though not, not necessarily the vast majority. You see, you saw a lot of blue in the figures which I presented, but again, these are like slices through the brain. The, most of the brain is still unaffected, and the VTA has very specific um, projections in different limbic structures and uh, maybe even in the medial prefrontal cortex, although again, that was not as visible in, um, in optofMRI. So these would be the rankings, which you might want to take into consideration when deciding what to study. Now, when you start studying these systems, either because you're so interested in all of the phenomena which they are related to, of which I've just mentioned dominance at the beginning, but which are incredibly manifold. So they go from anxiety, emotion, addiction, attraction, all manner of uh, interesting phenomena which cannot be volitionally controlled. So either if you want to study them because of what they're related to, or if you just want to use them as a mechanistic benchmark of brain function, uh, you might be um, interested in what the open questions are in the, in the sense of what should you be keeping an eye out, uh, either as a thing which you design your study around or as something which might come out as a byproduct of whatever other uh, methodological research you're trying to establish. So uh, the main gap in understanding for the monoaminergic systems in, in a brain imaging context is that there is no standardized summary of either structural or functional connectivity. As I said, these structures are incredibly difficult to image for DTI, which is basically the only way to obtain more or less standardized connectivity representations over the entirety of the brain. Of course, you could use histology, but the problem with histology is that you're not looking at everything at once. So it's really difficult to establish equivalence between different systems if you're just looking at them separately. So there's no such, uh, there's no such summary, and that basically means that you cannot be sure in how far activation from one of these systems maybe bleeds into the other systems or is blocked by some of the other systems. And this can be highly relevant, particularly if you're looking at the biological application of all of the things you study. If you look at the study of addiction, at the etiology, so at how addiction is formed, there is uh, ample literature suggesting the fact that there is a notable redundancy between the function of the dopaminergic and the serotonergic systems in the etiology of addiction. So uh, there might be significant crosstalk, and it's uh, difficult to disentangle it properly given the current information which we have about the functional and structural connectivity of the brain. So if you, if you could, for instance, obtain a map of how much activity bleeds from one, one of these nuclei into the others, that would be a very valuable contribution to research. The last point is, well, again, you might think that viral tracing will help you figure all of this out. And in fact, it can. Uh, it can offer you valuable insight, and the Allen Brain Connectivity Atlas offers maps which you can try to use to better inform your analysis simply because they allow you to visualize the structural projections so that you might use these as priors for your functional connectivity. But again, even viral tracing, although it offers much better contrast to noise for small structures, might be unsuited to give you high enough imaging with a high enough fidelity for these really, really, really small nuclei. Uh, so this about this about wraps it up. There, as I said, there are significant gaps still left in the understanding, but uh, these neurotransmitter systems are particularly relevant for um, the application of neuroscience, for the basic neuroscientific understanding of the brain, and even as completely mechanistic benchmark use cases for the establishment of new whole brain imaging technologies, which is more or less the direction in which brain imaging is going. It is a very systemic, holistic organ, meaning that ideally you would measure it all at once and not try to segment it into tiny pieces. And if you are doing that, why not look first and foremost at the neurotransmitter systems, which truly project to the entirety of the brain uh, in the most homogeneous fashion. Here on the last slides, you have all of my sources, which are quite interesting to read through if you're trying to do research into monoaminergic systems. And I would like to thank you for your attention, and I'm ready for your questions. Thank you.